Beastman, Twistoid, Perfuma, Kumira, Inferno Tracks. All of these names draw a picture in our mind and draw us closer to a brand, if not make literal sense upon first gaze. But how do you inject a little tongue-in-cheek touch or exotic branding to make a character memorable without obvious naming? Character names and what makes one legendary, next up on PopCon. from her you Names for action figures are just as important as names of characters in movies, television shows, and even books. And it's gotta be a lot of fun. It's been tackled by the best. Bob Budiansky, who wins the award for most legendary with Optimus Prime, and sometimes I think it's just taken care of by the night janitor after a long shift at deadline time. Talking to you, Hookerbot. Hooker the Roadbot. Whoever made that name, you know who you are. Think about that next time. Names are important to marketing and recognition. Staff writers are often engaged to set a mood or a tone, even if it's glaringly obvious. Comic books have a long history of alliteration, like Victor Von Doom and Peter Parker. But we're specifically talking about action figures from the 1980s, intellectual properties, and their cartoon counterparts. Now I'm not talking there haven't been some great first letter fun in those IPs, like our old friend Chip Chase here, but the usual modus operandi of the time was aptronyms. <laughs> Aptronym is defined as a person's name that is regarded as amusingly appropriate to their occupation, or in this case, action feature. Now you know. Okay, I'm going to say aptronym a lot, and I'm not even sure I'm saying it correct anyway. So let's make this a little more fun and uh, make it a drinking game. Go ahead, get your favorite beverage. Every time I mispronounce aptronym, go ahead and take a sip. Hell, take a gulp. All right, let's see how this goes. Go get your drink, I'll wait. Most action figures are named by manipulating maybe a design element, or it's highly influenced by an action feature. Then there are the names that are designed to keep us thinking about the brand, or the personality of a character based on the overall brand. Here, the name or the nickname reinforces the story being told in various media. And then sometimes there are names that are simply meant to be catchy and memorable at the time. They do not have any alliteration to their ability or their design element, but simply meant to raise the bar on naming conventions and have some fun, often rivaling any of the names found in popular nighttime soap operas of the time. These names are certainly dandies and never duplicated, but sometimes it's because of their uniqueness that becomes their greatest weakness. See, in their effort to be memorable, they just get lost over time, like tears in the rain. Calhoun Burns. Yes, Calhoun, very Southern, very soap opera, but we'll get to him a little bit later. Do you have a favorite action figure name? What was it and why? Is there a name that echoes the annals of time? Let me know in the comments below. Some of those answers and names might be a great subject for a future show. But as for now, let's break down the famous and the infamous naming conventions of some of our favorite playthings. As we review some of these highlighted characters, we can almost always put them into one of these three categories. One, obvious atronym. An atronym is a personal name aptly or peculiarly suited to its owner. Two, brand personality, intended to invoke an idea of the character by their dispositional portrayal, or broader yet, remind us of the entire branding of the franchise. And three, fictional fancies, intended to be real human names, but more often come off as highly stylized and fictitious, as no one's ever met a person with anything even closely resembling these names before. You can't find them in any phone book. Well, well, you couldn't if we were still using phone books. Do we all remember what a phone book is? Okay, I'm selecting here at random. So our first name is Soundwave. That is a great one to start with. This is Transformers. And Soundwave is a legacy name and a character for sure. These characters in the Transformers are unique, that their category is most rare, and that probably lends more credibility for the longevity of the toy line. Most of the Transformers fall under the second category, brand personality. In regards to both the toy line brand and a little description of the character, or its alt mode I should say, 
They are not named based on their transformation gimmick itself, but more often than not with a trait of the vehicle or item they transform into from their robot. Complete with cassettes, this mini cassette recorder player makes sound, so the name fits obviously. You can also argue that he makes waves for the Autobots, but that's going a bit too far. All right, who do we got next? We have Stinkor, okay. This is a great one, and we're talking Masters of the Universe here. This is look and action, period. If there was ever a franchise that was the embodiment of Afternoon, it's the Sword and Sorcery series, Masters of the Universe, and its sister series, Princess of Power. Hundreds of characters in the toy line and animated series, and they are the clear winner in the first category. It was rare to find a character that somehow did not fit into the naming convention. Now, as for Stinkor, he was late to the party, if he was even invited. Never in the cartoon, but his appearance and ability still go down in history in the toy line. During production, patchouli oil was introduced into the mold, and while you open that blister pack for a fresh new toy smell, you got a very unpleasant surprise. Okay, moving on, let's see. Uh, I, oh, Flint. Flint. Okay, when you hear Flint, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The G.I. Joe character, his code name. Uh, but he did have a real name, Dashiell Fairborn. Yeah, that's right, Dashiell Fairborn. Perhaps on Falcon's crest, but he will always be just Flint to us. Here is where we start playing for both sides, or for more than one category, I should say. Most of us recognize the name Flint, and that of his fellow Joes. But what most casual fans, or the general public, don't know is that almost all of them, especially the Joes, they were given full-blown names and backstory, and these names were dandies. So this group as a whole follows under Brand Personality, Category 2, and Fictional Fancies, Category 3. Like, Dashiell Fairborn, how likely are you going to meet a Dashiell Fairborn? Now, their code names were how we knew them, and in the vein of Brand Placement, those names made sense to the G.I. Joe's Covert Special Missions Military Force. Sometimes a name that just sounded cool, but other times, like in um, the examples of Mutt, Roadblock, and Gung Ho, a name that fits their personality on the show as a soldier. Now, a little Easter egg here, Fairborn is not unfamiliar with other appearances in related programs, namely the Transformers. In G1 lore, Marissa Fairborn was an ally to the Autobots after the events with Unicron. Like her father, she was a pilot. And knowing the history of Flint, it wasn't a stretch to believe that she was the daughter of he and his love from the G.I. Joes, Lady J. All right, let's keep this going with uh, Flutterina. Flutterina, what can I say? She's a butterfly. <laughs> like Masters of the Universe, Aptermin was the name of the game for Princess of Power. And let's put aside our beautiful flying insect lady and talk a little bit more about our heroine. And by default, her hero brother, as neither of their names feel like they fit the number one category right out of the gate. But alas, they do. She and Ra are both powerful in their own right. She is the pronoun of the female sex, and having it be the first part of her name lends itself to represent the most powerful woman, as it's given such emphasis. And Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun, and her name can kick your ass, so no bad mouthing. All right, let's stay in the Princess of Power world. Let's just chat a moment about Bo. Um, while we're talking about them, I think I got a double whammy here. Just as a boy's line needs a female, like Tila from Masters of the Universe, this girl-centric toy line needed a little testosterone. But they got Bo instead. I mean, what was with his best friend, Cowl? An owl koala. Or as I like to think of him, as an owl crossed with Charles Winchester from MASH. Anyway, Bo may have been a common name in the South at one time, but he was the Rebellion's archer. And what is an archer without his arrows? Nothing. And that is why Bo's mount was named Arrow. To complete the gag, of course. For God's sake, double abdomen whammy right there. All right. All right, moving on. I am picking the name uh, Tigra. Tigra. Now, everybody out there knows we're talking who? Yeah, Thundercats, of course. And if Masters of the Universe and Princess of Power were the epitome of the first category, or aptronym naming convention, Thundercats took it to the nth level at its core. I am Jaga, therefore I am a Jaguar. I am Chitara, therefore I am a Cheetah. Although early on, original characters like Chitara brought home a little of the basic cat skills and ability, in her case being fast, Tigra, being stealthy and quiet, could disappear, literally. Like is the case for most big cats, they blend in and disappear into their surroundings. However, it was far from usual for these characters to make any relative cat trait as part of their name. They simply were that cat, and also had some cat traits, 
so their name, although probably fun to create, couldn't have taken more than a work day or two to finalize. Let's move on, shall we, with Hondo McLean. All right, some people out there might be going, Hondo McLean? This is a pure dandy. This is a Category 3. This is Mask. Category 3 across the board. His name and his brethren all are fictional fancies, and that's it. Their names are class and elegance, but not usually memorable enough to stand the test of time. As loved as the Mask franchise is, when you are reminded of names like Calhoun Burns, Buddy Hawks, and Alex Sector, you might chuckle. And then, as you hear some of the others, you wonder if they had Dynasty or Dallas in mind when naming these wealthy, overindulgent men with big boy toys and a lot of privilege. Since the cartoon was designed during the same time as the toy line to help sell the merchandise, Kenner most likely used staff writers to come up with these names. And it sounds like they had a great time doing so. All right, here, okay, this name. This is Pizzazz. Okay, sure, we're talking gem here. And yeah, simply put, she's a doll. But they are a prolific intellectual property during this time period as any of the others on the list. And screw it, they were some of my favorites. So here we go, Pizzazz. Nicknames were used rather than code names like G.I. Joe. But unlike the holograms, the cast of characters in the bands that rivaled Jim all went by pseudonyms, like Pizzazz. This franchise played in two boxes like G.I. Joe. Although they were heavier on Category 2, the brand placement, they played with their Category 3 fancies often during the show. As in Pizzazz, whose real name was Phyllis Gabor. It was mentioned a lot during the series as we met our rich father, and we see the spoiled traits you might expect from someone named Gabor. I'm referencing, of course, Ava and Jaja Gabor, socialites from the latter half of the 20th century. Look them up. Well, the doll packaging did not mention the character's real name like the G.I. Joe file cards, you had to be paying attention to the show to either hear the likes of Mary Phillips and Phoebe Ash, who were Stormer and Rapture. Some names were certainly up there with other fictional fancies, but were used rarely and sometimes for emphasis or comic relief. For the most part, the names given to the characters in the series and toy line were fairly ordinary, unless it came to their nickname, which followed along the Category 2 branding of the franchise. That put the emphasis on both the MTV-centric series of rock bands and musicians, as well as the personalities expected by such characters. All right, we're going to continue talking about Jam because I want to bring up Riot. Riot, the other lead of the Hologram's rival band, The Stingers. Now, Riot's real name was Rory Llewellyn. Well, that's a lot of L's there. And certainly, right there, up there with the fictional fancies, his name was said a lot in the series for story arc sake. And Jem was unique in the fact that the storylines were followed and continued through the end of the series. Although you can see where Riot can come from the name Rory, the nickname fit the bad boy musician personality and the brand of the franchise while Rory is up there with other 80s rich kid names, fitting for members of the Brat Pack films. Look it up if I've lost you. As an army brat with a lot of daddy issues, he was quite an in-depth character, and I'm sure we can thank Christy Marks for that, who wrote many episodes of G.I. Joe as well. Unfortunately, the line was canceled before the doll was produced. However, prototypes and art for the packages were created. Oh God, he looks like a good candidate for my future episode entitled what the hell happened on the road from concept to reality? Yikes. All right, who we got next? Where are we going? We're going Bruce Sato. Okay, Bruce Sato is again from Mask, the Mobile Armored Strike Command. He was an Asian character. So let's start there with talking about 80s and diversity. There was a lot of it. And there was no one making a thing about it. It came with the territory and we liked it. Whether G.I. Joe or Mask, we found a lot of characters with international or varied backgrounds. For a kid, this was very positive. It is true, the names were an abomination to today's standards, but inclusion was not an issue, unlike the white guys doing their voices. But characters like Boris Bushkin, Ali Bombay, Julio Lopez, Jacques Lefleur, Ace Riker, wait, not Ace Riker. He holds the award for the most porn star sounding name in action figure film. Moving on, these guys and their obvious names help young people make a connection to diversity and the acceptance of all people. Not anything negative at all. You know what? Sexism and diversity in the 80s toys. Subject of a future show. Check. Okay, I got another double whammy for you though. Right there in the mass um, uh, annals of names, we've got Nevada Rushmore. I was saving him to laugh. He is a double whammy of stereotyping. Ooh, and not at all that creative unless he was an ad for the American Road Trip. 
All right. Looking in here, who do we got? Okay, we're going to go here with Dr. Mindbender. All right, Dr. Mindbender. Uh, his real name is classified, as it says on his file card. He was a member of Cobra in the G.I. Joe series. We do know he was an orthodontist. And from what we can gather, really liked the effects of nitrous oxide. I hadn't really realized I was introduced into chemical weapons and psychotropic drug manipulation at such a young and impressionable age. When it comes to this category for G.I. Joe, this is an example of being bi. Mindbender is both an aptronym due to his abilities and actions, as he is a real doctor, and having a code name, he is very covert and he was part of a militia, even if it was Cobra. So this is category two. So he fits into a couple of categories. I'm sure if we knew his real name, it would be a fancy, and Dr. Mindbender would have been all about the three word. Noticing his penchant for a good cod piece and a cape, not to mention that monocle, who knows? Maybe he could have gone by Dr. Genderbender. Now that is what I call the Bruce. What I find so incredible about this time and attention that a writer took to not only give a real name, but a detailed and believable backstory. And where do we find these details? Perhaps rarely used in the cartoon, every character's detail was on that file card on the back of their blister pack. I bet you cut them out, because I certainly did. I think when Marvel Comics were involved, and they were heavily on the creation of these characters, those writers needed additional information, and it only elevated play for us kids. Okay, it looks like we are going back to Masters of the Universe. This is Snout Spout. This again is look and action. Snout Spout is category one. He was made late in the line too. Too late to be on the cartoon. But to sell more, they introduced him in the Princess of Power cartoon. There he showed off his snout of power and to make it even more believable, he was given status as the Rebel's firefighter. I can't make this. Like she E-Man follows suit like most of his fellow warriors, but he too is a bit of stretching. Adam may sound fairly blasé, but if you think about the words that make of his alter ego's name, he and man, they totally convey the traditional gender attributes of masculine and strong that fit along with the image we are presented of the character as well as his personality. I think overall, Tila might be the only character in the Masters of the Universe that breaks the rule. Even as we think of Skeletor's female warrior, Evil Lynn, we get the prefix evil to help identify something, well, we probably already knew. Speaking of Skeletor, we don't have to go into how obvious that is, do we? And I'm not obvious, not even a little, you bubble-headed buffoon. Eh. Sorry, Boneface. Next. All right, we're going to keep going here. This is kind of fun. We could do this all day. I've got Blaster. Uh, we're back to the Transformers, and this is the Autobots Communications Specialist. And also, like Soundwave, he made music, complete with mini cassettes. But this time, Blaster and his voice made us keenly aware that he was named after the once common alternate name for the boombox, Ghetto Blaster. Yep, I said Ghetto. It wasn't a second thought in the 80s. It was just the name of our compact stereos that everyone was willing and excited to carry on their shoulder. Once again, as they fall under the Category 2 brand placement by their name taken from their alt mode, it kept this line's vision consistent. In the same vein, there was Reflector. I like talking about Reflector, he's one of my favorite characters. Taking a picture reflects or mirrors an image of us when we see the picture. Again, keeping a consistent brand through the whole robots turning into other things, by naming them relevant to their thingy, uh, I mean their other thing, you know what I mean. In the series, these were three characters, or sometimes many clones for army building, with just one being a variation from the others to portray their quote-unquote leader. These three characters transformed into a camera. The action figure, on the other hand, was actually three completely original characters with their own names and personalities, Spectro, Viewfinder, and Spyglass. They were only offered as a mail-away figure and did not last long on the animated series as more dynamic characters were introduced in the denizens of Decepticons. Ooh, that was like an alliterative. Moving on. All right, moving on. All right, next up we have Aja Leaf. Yes, we're back in the world of Gem. Uh, trying to cover some of the good guys here. Uh, Aja was a member of the Holograms, and she brought a little diversity with her Asian influence. She, like the rest of the musicians in the Holograms, used their real names. And like them, it fairly sounded normal. And why do you think it sounded so normal? Because her name, Leaf, along with the surname Benton for the star Gem, as well as the real last name of Stormer character, which was Phillips, and Pizzazz's Gabor, these are all names of pioneers in 20th century holographic science. 
Even Elmsford, the last name of the Shana character, is the name of where a research facility that much of this work was done. Elmsford, New York. You can be taught. All right, next up we have Monkeyan. Okay, Monkeyan. We kind of know where we're going here, and we know we're at Thundercats. We know it's Category 1. The Aptronym. Perhaps a writer had had enough with Vulture Man and Jackal Man. And if you slur your words enough, Monkey Man can sound a bit more evolved. <laughs> Get it? Evolved. And eventually go by Monkey. Luckily, there was no denying the simian characteristics in the animation movement and the voice by Peter Newman, who also voiced characters in the avian-centric Thundercat homage, Silverhawks. And while we're talking about the obvious in Thundercats, let's hit on Mumron. Not maybe as obvious as Vulture Man, but I think his name identifies pretty good. He's an undead mummy. Mum. Ra's an Egyptian. Done. Even his dog, Mamut, although cute, is just another play on the Aptorman naming convention. All right, moving right along here. Okay, this is a great one. Something that brings a lot of imagery and a lot of thoughts to people's mind when I say the name Baroness. The Baroness. Real name, Anastasia de Cobre. Never mind her surname sounds a lot like Cobra. She was a European aristocrat, and she used that leverage in making life hell for the Joes. She was both mysterious and relentless. Not frail. This name evoked royalty and business. And she did it all, and she did it with that unique accent and those thin round frame spectacles she is iconic for. But I want to jump over to another female from the G.I. Joe line, Scarlet. It would be a shame not to mention Scarlet. Or as her file card says, Shayna O'Hara. This name and the character and her hundreds of action figures are legendary and as iconic as her red ponytail. Although no accent, she is described as being from Atlanta, Georgia. Curious, as home to another Southern O'Hara, Scarlet of Gone with the Wind fame. See, if you dig a little deeper, you can always find out more. All right, let me see. I'm going to have a couple more here. Okay. Oh, surprise, Casey Jones. Perhaps the 80s were not their heyday, but TMNT belongs on this list as much as any. With his weapons of choice, I feel like Casey at the bat would have fit him more. Anyone remember that story? All right, well, anyway, Casey at the bat would fit him a lot more than Casey Jones, which is of a railroad engineer obsessed with speed who was killed by another locomotive. But I suppose if all the turtles are named after Renaissance artists, it really doesn't matter. Casey Jones has a fairly acceptable name of anyone you might meet on the street. Of course, if I met this hockey stick yielding guy on the street, I would turn and run. Both he and his cohort and friend, April O'Neil, are names of everyday people. This makes them memorable in their own right, and they have stood the test of time. All right, just because uh, this has been fun, I'm going to throw out some not really honorable mentions, but some other names that uh, I think I want to point out because they're just too crazy not to. Um, Princess of Power kept coming up with names that are just too crazy not to mention. And um, I want some Catra and Scorpia. You know, in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, Catra and Scorpia, how afternoon, how category one can you get? Their look and ability is there. Even Catra becomes a cat. Then we move on to Mermista. Now, Mermista was definitely a season uh, or a series two action figure. When you think of her name, you think of Mer, which means ocean, similar to Merman. But this heroine included a twist. No, not a twist of lemon, but of mist. Oh, wow, a little, a little rhyme there. This was the feature of her toy. When you squeezed her shell backpack, she squirted water out of her shell necklace. Then we move on to peek blue Okay, perhaps it is the male peacock, but the eyes on the feathers helped her to see things elsewhere. So her decor and a reference to the bird's design is perfect for her name. Although most of the names can bring a groan or a sigh, some, like peek blue really are a bit more creative than people like to believe. And heck, they all made it into the recent Netflix series, so they must have been a success and have also stood the test of time. Well, this only catch or scratches the surface. I hope you've enjoyed this little joyride down into breaking down the naming conventions of some of our favorite action figures. But there are so many lines and characters out there. Now that you're armed with the categories, I'm sure you can use this game with all of your friends as a great time passer. And don't forget the drinking game too. Remember, this is my take on the subject. This is my way of breaking down some of those names and having a great and friendly pop conversation with all of you. We never have to look far for pop culture. And lucky for us, I have a well springing with content to bring you. So please share a comment below. Let me know what you'd like to see on the channel so I can develop the PopCon experience. Share with your friends and always remember LSN. Like, subscribe, notify. Help me entertain myself while I entertain you. Until next time.